So I would uh, uh, like to uh, introduce David Anderson, who is going to chair this uh, this group. Uh, David's uh, in the uh, Department of Anthropology at the University of Aberdeen, uh, and I've had the uh, uh, real pleasure uh, on a couple of occasions in recent years to uh, uh, spend some time at uh, at Aberdeen. Uh, the uh, Arctic Domus project uh, is is one that uh, touches directly on themes of relationality uh, as uh, uh, a way of being in the world, uh, a way of being, becoming, and belonging uh, in the world, um, and uh, and so one of the 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 core axes of of Cicada, which has to do with collective life projects and political projects that are launched from, from that position, uh, I think uh, are richly informed by, by this group's work, which is dealing with human-animal relations in, in quite complex ways throughout the circumpolar north. David. Hey, thank you, Colin. I, uh, we have the misfortune of coming so late in the afternoon, but I'm hoping that we can present to you some interesting examples from around the Circumpolar North that might spur some of the discussion that we're going to do after this. In contrast to the other presentations, I'm reporting on a project group. It's a project group involving about 26 people funded by the European Research Council and based at the University of Aberdeen, but including about seven universities across the Circumpolar Arctic. Our um, main research agenda, again, a little bit different um, than um, some of the things that we've heard here, is to um, take one of the relational or ontological axes um, that many people have spoken about, something that um, many communities across the Circumpolar North say um, unite them, and that is an interest and a feeling of re respect and responsibility for the animals that sustain them. And we're um, our project is aiming at comparing um, these ideas and, and bringing the people together that hold these ideas to talk about how these ideas can fold out into scientific discourse, political discourse, other types of relationships. And so we're, we're, we're trying to use metaphors that are meaningful for people in the Arctic and see how they, they fold out into some of the other categories that one finds generally within a university. Um, the main subtitle of the project is Human-Animal Relationships in the Circumpolar Arctic. Uh, it's uh, funded by um, uh, one funding council that, that sponsors so-called frontier research, that is research that is not proven, that is not written up, that may be difficult to do. Unlike a lot of the projects here, um, it certainly does not um, sponsor community work. Um, and um, uh, this is um, very difficult to do with European financing, but it doesn't um, prevent us from doing it. And so, well, um, we don't have um, indigenous um, co-PIs. We do work with a lot of indigenous people, and um, we did invite two to come here, but they were unable, due to family commitments, to come and, and stand beside us. Um, so um, we, we work within somewhat different funding conditions than, than people have in Canada, but we still um, bring with us um, our relationships and, and um, our own upbringing for most of us in Canada and try and turn this European money into a collaborative project. Um, as I said, we're looking at relationships with animals in the north, and the heuristic term that we use to bring this together is that of um, the, the domus, which I won't put a lot of um, meaning into. It originally was thought up by an archaeologist. We're using it as um, a catch-all term that refers to everything that does not refer to domination of animals, because the literature on, on domestication is always about some clever person who first use a whip or a lasso to tame an animal and turn the animal into property and make the animal obey his or her will. Um, our argument is, is that um, this does not capture the complexity of human-animal relationships anywhere, but certainly not in the Arctic. So most of the communities where we work um, have very uh, nuanced relationships with animals, um, and uh, almost all of the scientific literature um, says that they have an incomplete relationship, an incomplete type of domestication. Arctic sled dogs are half wild, um, Siberian reindeer are half wild, none of them are completely domestic. 
our point of view is saying that this is the strength of human-animal relationships in the Arctic, that, that there is a respectful relationship whereby animals and people cooperate together without one dominating the other. And so um, rather than using the domus as a term for domination, we're using it as a term that talks about cooperation or a kind of a, a, a common habitation, the domus as a, as a, a home, a common homeland. Um, the project is based um, roughly around three animals, which were on the previous slide, uh, reindeer and caribou, uh, fish, and on dogs and wolves. It's based roughly in um, nine settings in four regions, um, from Fennoscandia, the Russian Federation, across North America, and, and even in, in northern Scotland, um, with, with one student looking at um, the, the animals that are held in the highlands. The, um, um, the, the regions are quite numerous and there's people um, working in each of them and I can't go into a lot of detail about each one. Um, I've made a list of some but not all of the communities where we're working. Um, some of these communities, um, as we've heard today, um, have um, um, an identity as uh, First Nations, have councils and, and, and committees that approve research. And with these communities, we go through the protocols of, of having our, our research approved, discussed, and structured by the community. Other places, most characteristically in Russia, these structures are lacking, and we, we make the appropriate um, uh, connections and, and negotiations with local authorities, with federal state authorities, with other types of authorities that monitor scientific research. So we have a very um, complex set of relationships with these communities. Um, I, I think... Um, a map like this is somewhat deceptive because um, most of these communities we've worked with for a long time, certainly um, the Gwich'in communities in the Western Arctic, um, several of us have worked there since um, the 1980s, and, and so this project is just following on a series of projects and collaborations and friendships and solidarities and, and, and continues in that particular way. And, um, in the discussion period after, we'd be happy to talk about any of these particular regions. What we've prepared for you as a sample of our research is some fieldwork examples from three settings. So I'll be talking um, mainly about uh, fieldwork relationships with caribou and reindeer, mainly in Russia. Um, my colleague Rob will, will speak about uh, his work within the Gwich'in settlement area, and uh, Guru will speak about her work in, in Tana in um, um, northern Norway. Within the uh, realm of human-animal relationships, as I said, we're, we're trying to look at alternate ways of understanding dynamics. We've, we've heard some talk about the way that wildlife managers um, look and manage caribou relationships in terms of numbers, in terms of quotas, in terms of preventing or policing the amount of harvesting. One of the idioms that we're working with that has come from Gwich'in hunters is looking at the social structure. So um, many hunters, especially the elderly hunters, are worried about things that alter um, the leadership tendencies of, of the caribou. They have local hunting restrictions that talk about not bothering the leader, the first head caribou that leads the migration across the Mackenzie Mountains. And so with this emphasis on the social structures that animals develop within themselves, we feel that there's a more interesting metaphor of, of how to establish relationships, how to manage relationships without looking at helicopter counts or, or um, uh, collars that, that, that estimate that the numbers of animals. And so we, we build on these particular social metaphors. Is that the next one? Yeah, sorry. Um, one particularly complex um, bit of research that um, I picked uh, that I thought might address some of the interests in conservation is on the um, research into local animal types. This particular slide shows some of the work that I've been doing on um, domestic and wild reindeer types in eastern Siberia, working both with um, um, Dolgan and uh, Evenki um, pastoralists and their own family herds which are, are held privately. We've collected a lot of oral information about different types of reindeer, which we have then been also submitting for laboratory analysis to get um, a, a laboratory view of how these, these particular breeds work out. This particular process is not done to vet the traditional knowledge. Rather, it's an attempt to try and see if there's a method by which these local breeds can be identified and classified, because this is an idiom that could be very powerful for protecting local interests within the Russian Federation. Unlike other countries in the world, such as Canada, Latin America, East Africa, um, it would be very difficult, dangerous, or meaningless to talk about um, getting sovereignty to land within large parts of the Russian Federation. 
However, if a community were allowed to um, be responsible for protecting a, a pedigree stock of reindeer, they would get state subsidies, protection for their territories from um, industrial interests. By using this particular idiom, we're hoping that the scientific methodology can bolster local attempts to um, protect their local breeds. Um, the methods that we're, we're using, and I won't go into detail, and especially because I only half understand them myself, but they're, they're, they are experimental. They haven't been applied to um, reindeer. Um, and so there's a, a need to invest in the methods first and then in the results and then trying to, to get them ratified as a way of, of um, conservancy and protection in that particular region. Um, many of our people are doing um, animal life histories. Um, the, um, we, by this particular strategy, we're, we're trying to read the history of the community through the behavior of the animals. We, we try and um, talk to people about where animals grew up, how they might have been traded through marriage, through friendship, through exchange how they move across the landscape. Um, the archaeologist that is working with us from the University of Alberta does very refined um, studies of the bone structure and the content of the bones to understand what animals eat, um, how their bodies have been structured and how their bodies have been changed by their um, um, uh, association with people. And in this way, we, we get a common history or common life history, both for the people and the animals in that particular setting. Um, I, a final um, area that, that leads into the topic of, um, of, of conservation and protection of biodiversity is looking at the structure of plant communities in areas where um, many indigenous people no longer live. In this particular um, uh, image, there's um, an open meadow um, in an area that was um, uh, stripped and mined for gold um, roughly about the time of the Klondike gold rush in the 19th century. Um, Evenki pastoralists no longer live there, but the signs of um, their former reindeer um, herds are seen within the plant signatures within this meadow. So by using um, um, small slices of earth that are then conducted for chemical analysis, it's possible to construct the history of this particular indigenous nation going back in this particular case for 700 years in this particular meadow. Um, this is quite a, a radical um, step to take within the Russian Federation where locally it's thought that the local people had just moved in there somewhat chaotically in the last 50 years. It, it creates um, a sense of density and a sense of, of connection to the landscape, again in a format that often state actors would recognize and approve of. So um, to continue with these examples, I'll call on my colleague Rob Wishart from the University of Aberdeen. Okay, um, trying to think of what, what to talk about uh, here with this particular audience and, and within, our, within our project. Um, and here's a map, and we talked about maps yesterday and all of their limiting factors and, and the way that they carve up the, the world. And this one does that in, in some interesting ways as well. Um, uh, I'll maybe come back to talk about that a little bit later. But uh, what we're Myself and my colleague Peter Louvers and working with the Gwich'in Social Cultural Institute uh, within Arctic Domus, what we're interested in are these sort of multiple ways that, that people um, and, and animals, be they dogs, fish, caribou, uh, many other uh, animals that we, that we also work with there, um, engage in these multiple forms of cultivation, multiple forms of, of mutual constitution, and, uh, and, and being together, living out a, within a, a life world, if you wanted to put it that way. Um, we're also keenly interested in, in breaking uh, the hunter versus um, cultivator stereotype. Uh, perhaps that's beautifully documented by the painting at the back and in the settler fantasy of what agricultural life is like, <laughs> rather, rather than that of, of, of a hunter who, who lives a punctuated existence in relationship to an animal that they just happen to capture, right? And we want to break down those and show how, how um, a, a life world that, that's built upon multiple forms of relationships go into this process, what we call hunting, right? And, and, or picking berries or, or doing anything out on the land in that way. Um, we've been particularly interested in the history of the connections between um, the, the fisheries of the Gwich'in, the way that uh, fish was used as a, as, a, as a fuel for people and dogs, 
the way that the dogs would take the people up to hunt caribou, uh, uh, all existing in, in kind of a big circular pattern that, that would be very difficult to cut out to say, okay, well, this is one activity going on here. This is one activity going on there. Fishing is hunting as far as they're concerned. Uh, picking berries is hunting as, as far as the, the Gwich'in that, that I have been instructed by have told me. Um, the, um, the process of, of fishing uh, in the summertime and, and storing enough fish uh, to, to sustain you through the winter and sustain your dogs is something that uh, you know has a very long history and, it, and it's continued today even though the dogs have have lessened their presence in, in the in the Gwich'in life world at, at the moment uh, with mechanized transport but the Gwich'in are very um, uh, they worry tremendously that, that it's the mechanization that's actually the punctuation, not the, the animals, that the, the skidoos are going to go away, the, the trucks will go away, and certainly the, the gas that fuels them is going to go away eventually. And uh, the ability to store fish, whether it be um, in, a, in a fish pit such as this that has eroded out of the banks of the Peel River, um, and we were very fortuitous to, to come upon this um, while traveling down the river that the, the peel had just eroded at that time and showed us what a fish pit was like. And we had learned so many, from so many stories how people used to store fish underground like this, store fish for the winter. And we came upon this and said, hey, look, here it is. Here's, here's a fish pit for you guys to look at, right? And, uh, you know, a couple of weeks later, it was gone. The river took it um, and, and it was gone. The, the life of living with the river is crucially important for this. Uh, and we heard about this last night in, in particular in, in the last session on confluences and, and river restoration. And many of the things that were talked about last night, um, you, you know, would, would fit beautifully with, with how the Gwich'in talk about their rivers as well. The river is seen and has been spoken about since the first time I, I ever did research there as, as a watching, listening, reactful uh, person, right? That it's, it's there, it's, in, it's in, in engagement with them, and that it's only through its gifts of fish and its gifts of transportation and its gifts of, of water uh, that the caribou come back, that anything is possible in, in this particular world. Um, This is the Peel River in the springtime just after breakup. It's, you know, it's a beautiful place and it's a beautiful river. And the people talk about it in this way from at that point. Recently, and this is to get into some of the, the conversation on mining that has been going on here. Recently, there has been a proposed mining project uh, to open up the Peel River watershed in the Yukon Territory, an area in that map that the Gwich'in, because of some guy drawing a line, a line at some point in the distant past, do not have a, a, a full set of jurisdictional controls and are having to fight, you know, what's going to happen in the Peel River watershed if they open up a mine. And they know from talking to, to everybody else and seeing the pictures that fly around, uh, and, and indeed from some of the stories that from here as well, that the guarantees that they've been given by the mining companies that their river will be fine, that there won't be any pollution, uh, that, that they, they can control tailings, any of these disasters that they've seen in other parts of the world won't happen here. They know that that is an out and out lie, right? They, and they, they realize that. And so there's been a very strong reaction to this and, and a strong uh, uh, fight by the Gwich'in themselves to uh, try to stop this from happening and, and that there have been successes and, and there have been uh, setbacks as well and, and it's one that, that's still ongoing and it, it's still out there and it's a fight that, that, that is going to take some time uh, but the Gwich'in are, are deeply engaged with this but in this fight we can, uh, we can continue to see this, this relationship of, of how the river is in itself um, part of who they are, and, and it's part of, of the fish, and it's part of, 
of the caribou and it's part of everything. It's all engaged together. And they talk about it in that way. And the critique that's leveled against them is that, oh, well, you're only talking in this kind of uh, spiritual, sentient kind of way because you're fighting the mind, right? But they were talking this way from the day that I got there, right? Way before the mind was, was proposed in that way. And, and certainly, there's a, there is a confusion between volume, because they may be saying it more often right now, than with, uh, with the message itself. Right? And there's a deep confusion of that. I just want to leave with an inspirational story of, of one particular Gwich'in individual who um, has taken it upon himself to fight this, this um, proposal. Uh, his name is Brad Firth, but he's better known as Caribou Legs. He, um, he led a, a, a tragic life and uh, growing up in, in very difficult circumstances and started to run as a way of, of curing himself and reintegrating himself into his community. Um, but what he decided to do one day after listening to the elders talk about the Peel River and talk about why it needs to be protected, he decided to run from Inuvik to Whitehorse, right? Um, which is uh, 1,200 kilometers, something like that, um, uh, through the mountains, through the, through the Richardson Mountains. And he decided to do it at the time when uh, the grizzly bears were just coming out of their dens. And, <laughs> and there were, you know, I drove 100 kilometers of that road and counted 20 grizzlies in that stretch. <laughs> He's an incredibly brave man for doing this. But he ran to Whitehorse to deliver a petition, right? Um, he strapped the skin from the legs of caribou to his shins, which you can see in the, in the, in the bottom left picture, uh, uh, to give himself strength and to give himself the, this ability to run just like the caribou. Uh, he got to Whitehorse, delivered his petitions, and uh, realized that wasn't going anywhere, so he went to Vancouver and then ran back from Vancouver to Whitehorse after talking with the mining corporations and delivering the, the petitions to them. And when that didn't work, he went back to Vancouver and ran to Ottawa, <laughs> right? He's incredible, this guy. That's one guy. And after what Colin, you know, the question that you had at the end where we worry about our ability to do things and our ability yeah. to change things, here's a, here's a guy I think we can look to and say, wow, right? He's just a fantastic guy. The fact that he calls himself caribou legs and people call him caribou legs as a way, as a vehicle for protecting the water and protecting the Peel River speaks directly to this uh, mutual constitution, I think, and this mutual form of, of cultivation of relationships that, that we're trying to, to get to and, and to, to document uh, within this project. Thank you. And uh, I will now turn it over to Gruwin. Thank you. So I'll uh, speak about um, part of our research um, that has been going on in the Tana River in the far north of Norway. Um, and this, the red bit that you see at the top is the part of Norway that has been given back to the Sami population as an estate, as a Finnmark estate. And this is supposedly self-governed, modeled possibly on Nunavut, but has become something quite different. Um, No? It's, it's the, yeah, it's the right one. Yeah. This one on the right hand side. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. 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 Um, this is a picture of, uh, of Tana River in the spring. Tana, uh, or Dianu, means uh, big, just as the Yukon means big, I suppose. This, this is big means every big river in the world is big. Um, and it is called, um, and um, here we are in the summer. Tana as Finnmark is self-governed, and self-governed here means that there's biologists who will get numbers, give the numbers to the Ministry of the Environment, who will then tell the local fish management how they will regulate the river. Um, and so the difference between now and 
end a few years ago, is that now people have to regulate themselves and they have to catch the poachers themselves. Big difference. This is a, a picture that um, is there to remind me that there is a bigger picture than the Tana, and that is that Norway has become one of the greatest uh, fish farming nations in the world. And it has had enormous consequences on, on the Atlantic salmon all over the Norwegian coast. Not so much in Finnmark, and so the fish in Tana River is not, has not been directly affected by um, fish farming, but it has had an effect anyway because salmon has become even more iconic than it has been in the past. There are many kinds of Sami salmon fishermen in, in the Tana River. On the coast, we have um, Sami, coastal Sami fishermen fishing with nets. In the delta, you have people trawling. And further up in the river, people are fishing with wares. And salmon is something people speak about all winter. There's, people spend this early spring you know, longing for the salmon and speaking about you know, what the taste will be like when it comes back. And when the summer comes and the fishing starts, everything else stops, you know, and, and fishing is all that people do. And there are all the sort of big social uh, activities take place along the river. You know, people come together as a family and celebrate the first fish and talk about fish from last year and whether this year was bigger or better. Then there's the anglers. And uh, because the Tana River borders on two nations, Norway and Finland, and um, on the Finnish side of the river, the Sami has um, the indigenous rights protection on this on, on the Finnish side is much worse than in Norway, which means that there's no special rights for reindeer herding, there's no special rights, uh, there's no, um, um, they, uh, nothing to help them stay where they want to stay uh, in, the, in the communities that they want to live in. And so what's basically happened instead is that the Finnish government aggressively um, promotes uh, angling, tourist angling. And so, um, for the last, uh, since the 1970s, there's been a 50% increase in the, in the amount of anglers in this river, and there's no catch and release. And so there's very aggressive angling fishermen. And at the moment, they take out over 50% of all the salmon in the river. At the same time, there should be negotiations on a state level between Norway and Finland. But because Finland has a different uh, ambition to Norway, these negotiations haven't taken place for over 20 years. So what can the Norwegians do? Well, the Ministry of, of the Environment, thinking to protect the salmon, every year it cuts back the coastal of the, the Sami fisheries. Every year there's a few day, few less days of fishing, a few hours less, yeah, you're able to catch a little bit less, you have to change the mesh size, uh, continues, um, and, and all the Sami politicians spend all their trying time to, uh, to combat this. Um, but nothing can happen until there's negotiations with the Finnish. And so this year, uh, the Finnish finally came to the negotiation table and um, they accepted a cut in the, in, the angler, in, in the angling, in the amount of anglers they could actually bring to the river every year. So that's great. But what the Norwegian government responded with was to say, well, look at this, this is so great. The Finnish are accepting a cut in the, in the amount of anglers, so now you, the Sami, have to accept another cut just to, to make sure that they understand our willingness to negotiate. And so that's the situation at the moment. Oh. And um, so this is a very tiny little bit of you know, what's been going on with the salmon studies that we have been doing. And um, what the Arctic Domus has been able to do in, with regard to our sort of salmon research is that it has brought uh, comparative perspectives on salmon people along the Yukon, in the Kola Peninsula, on the Tana River, and, and these are of 
a theoretical interest in the sense that they um, provide larger perspectives on human-animal relations, and, but also on kinds of domestication, like the legal domestication, scientific domestication, the local uh, domestication, and how these come together. And um, also, what these kind of comparisons are able to do is to, <coughs> sorry, open perspectives of new kinds of collaboration between people and scientists, or uh, on how to create conditions of cooperation between people sharing resources across nations or at different places in the river. And so this is a tiny little bit of that. So thank you. I'm a little bit unsure how much time we have for, for questions, if there, there are any. Um, one thing that I, I intended to, to say at the beginning is that in um, being newcomers to this network, um, although we've been friends with Colin for some time, this is the first time I've attended this meeting and the second time Rob has, we, we've been trying to invest in, in some of the research that you're, uh, you've been doing. So Sarah Moritz, whom I'm, I'm sure many of you know, has, has come to Aberdeen and enriched um, our knowledge with her experience with salmon communities in British Columbia. And Joya Barnbrook, um, who's just come for the first time, will be starting her PhD um, field work in northern Quebec. So we're hoping that this can be the beginning of this next phase of the project um, through our students. So with that, I'll welcome any questions. Yes. <laughs> uh, hi, I like uh, very much your concept of uh, domestication. I had never, or, or your interpretation of the relationship between people and animals. I hadn't heard before about it, so I think it's a very uh, interesting approach. And I was wondering, um, it's just a um, conceptual um, a question that I have. Uh, if you have looked at the um, co-evolution framework um, uh, to understand how uh, humans have interacted and, and influenced and, and um, uh, had a, a role in uh, animals, evolution also throughout uh, human history because there is a similarity with <coughs> plants as well mm -hmm. uh, like in um, in uh, America uh, corn and um, Chile for example to um, classical examples of how uh, people have been able to uh, create a very close evolutionary uh, relationship so I was wondering if, if you're considering that point of view. Yeah, thank, th thank you for that. I'm not trained in biology, but I, I, I do enjoy that literature and I have looked at it. And certainly um, our colleagues that are working with, with Arctic dogs work with that quite a bit with um, both wolves and dogs with one of the arguments that, that, that wolves um, gradually came into human society and, and in a sense um, uh, adopted humans as people that, that looked after them and then became dogs gradually. So there, there's a lot of evidence for that in, in Arctic places. In, in my own research, I've just been interested in how people build places for reindeer and, and draw them in by making pastures that are attractive. And in that way, they, they build a closer relationship with them, not control them, but, but make a, a setting where they're comfortable to live. Questions. Uh, first, a uh, uh, warm applause for. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>